Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on that little notification bell next to the subscribe button so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about the case of Susan Swiddell. She was a young woman who just suddenly disappeared one night in early 1988 during a blizzard, a snowstorm, and she never returned home. And tragically, Susan's case remains unsolved to this day, more than three and a half decades later. And this is honestly one of the most baffling and confusing disappearance cases that I've ever come across. Susan's family are still working so hard to try and get some answers and some closure, particularly her sister, Christina. In fact, I do just want to give a shout out to a podcast that I listened to during my research of this case. It's called The Unfound Podcast. I listened to their episode on this case, which Christine was actually featured in, and it was so incredibly helpful and informative when I was putting my notes together for this video. So a huge thank you to Christine and The Unfound Podcast for that. I will leave the episode about Susan's case linked in the description box in case you want to listen to it, and I'll also leave a link to The Unfound Podcast podcast channel in the description box too. A really, really great podcast. And as always with the unsolved cases that I cover, I will leave some contact details down below for anyone watching that thinks they may have any information about the disappearance of Susan Swiddell. And yeah, having said all of that, let's just get into the case. So for this week's case, we are going back more than 35 years now to January of 1988 in Lake Almo. And Lake Almo is a city located in Washington County in Minnesota. Minnesota in the US. And this is Susan Swiddell. Her full name was Susan Ann Swiddell and she was 19 years old at the time that this case took place. Susan was born on the 13th of February 1968. Her mother was called Kathy and I couldn't actually find the name of her father online but I do know that her parents were divorced by the time this case occurred. I believe they separated when Susan was around five years old but not before they had another child. They had another baby three years after Susan, another little girl named Christine. And Susan's sister, Christine, said that she and her big sister were very close, especially after their parents separated. I mean, they would have the occasional bicker and argument as sisters do, but for the most part, they got along really well and they were always there for each other. They did have a couple of step siblings because their father went on to have more children with another woman that he began a relationship with. But as I understand it, Sue and Christine weren't ever really that close with their step siblings but they were very very close with each other and eventually their mother Kathy got custody of the two girls so they were living with their mum. It was the three of them in the house, Kathy, Susan and Christine. And as far as I'm aware Susan had a pretty normal good upbringing for the most part. She did well in school and she was described by those that knew her as being very bubbly, very fun, very sweet and kind. Although her sister Christine said that she was also very much an introvert. She liked her alone time. She kept herself to herself. She didn't have loads and loads of friends, but she did have a couple of very, very close friends. She kept her circle quite small and she liked it that way. But having said that, she also really loved the outdoors. She loved going camping and skiing and skating and things like that. She liked arts and crafts. In her teens, she wasn't very much of a party goer. That wasn't really her thing. Instead, she would enjoy going to church. According to sources, she was in the choir and the band at the Christ Lutheran Church in Lake Almo. That was her local church. She would sing in the choir and she would also play the handbells. She loved music. Her sister said that she loved listening to pretty much all the songs that other people were enjoying in the 80s. She liked Madonna and Cyndi Lauper and Robert Plant. She also liked acting and dancing, anything theatrical it seems. As I said, she did very well in school. She would often get top marks. She was a very, very smart girl and after she graduated from high school, Susan decided to go to the university. University of Wisconsin in River Falls to study psychology. However, she didn't stay at university for too long because she really struggled being away from home, living so far from her mum and her sister. She was really homesick. And so after her first year, Susan decided to leave uni and go back home, go back to Lake Elmo. She did have a relationship with a guy who was a couple of years younger than her. They dated for a while, about a year and a half, and then they broke up. And when Susan returned home, 
she entered the world of work. She actually got two different jobs in the same shopping mall in Oak Park Heights, which is just over five miles away from Lake Elmo. One job was at a boutique shop called Body and Soul, and the other was at a Kmart store. And she was basically working full-time hours with these jobs combined. She would do usually a morning shift at the boutique shop, and then later on in the afternoon slash evening, she would head to her shift at the Kmart store. And that happens to be exactly what 19-year-old Susan Swedow was doing on the day that she suddenly disappeared. The date was the 19th of January 1988, a day that began just like any other for Susan. She woke up that morning, she had breakfast, she got ready, and then she eventually headed to work. I believe she did have a shift at the boutique shop that morning, and then later that day she began another shift at Kmart. Her shift at Kmart ended around 9pm that evening evening just before 9pm and a few hours before this actually at around 4pm she rang home her home phone and she told her mother and sister that as soon as she finished work she would drive straight home she was eager to get home and just relax and watch a movie apparently but anyway fast forward to a couple of hours later at 9pm Susan finished her shift she was getting ready to leave the store and her colleagues actually noticed that before she left Susan got changed she changed out of this red pantsuit that she had been wearing for work that day into a sweater and a skirt and apparently her colleagues thought that this was a little bit strange because a sweater and a skirt a rather short skirt too I think wasn't really the best thing to wear given the bad weather conditions at the time in Minnesota you see around this time mid-January of 1988 that day actually specifically I think a snowstorm a blizzard had descended on the area it was very very windy and very snowy so it was freezing outside and so when Susan got changed into that skirt one of her co-workers made a comment like oh I'm not sure you're dressed properly for the weather but Susan just kind of ignored this comment she brushed it off and she said goodbye and left the Kmart she walked to the parking lot of the mall to her car she had a maroon colored 1975 Oldsmobile Cutlass similar to the image on screen when she arrived at her car she switched on the engine to warm it up before she started driving and she also began like cleaning and brushing the snow off of the windscreen so that she could obviously see. And it's believed that Susan probably would have been very nervous about driving home that night because her sister Christine said that she really, really did not like snowstorms. Ever since she was a young child, blizzards had always really scared Susan. So she must have been really anxious when she realised that she was going to have to drive home in these conditions. But anyway, after a few minutes, she got in her car and she began the drive home. However, Susan never made it home that night. You see, during the journey, after driving a couple of miles, Susan noticed that her car was starting to overheat because there was smoke coming out from under the hood of the car. So she started to really worry, as anyone would, and she decided to stop and pull into a gas station located on the corner of Manning Avenue and Stillwater Boulevard. This gas station was only about a mile away from her home. Now, the account that I'm about to tell you is what the police were later informed by the gas station attendant who was working that night. This is what she could recall. So the attendant remembered seeing Sue pull into the parking lot in her 1975 Oldsmobile Cutlass. She parked up and then literally moments later another car pulled into the parking lot and parked alongside Susan's car. This second car was described by the attendant as being an older model with sports wheels. It was light in colour although it was quite dirty and one source states that the attendant said that it may have been like a white Ford Thunderbird model or something similar. Anyway this car pulled up alongside Susan and the person driving it was a man. There is a composite sketch of this man so I'll put that on the screen now but he was described as being quite a tall man. He was estimated to be about six foot two in height. He was thin around his early 20s. He was unshaven. He had quite long hair which was like a sandy brown colour. It was curly hair and it came down to about his shoulders. He was described as being well built and he was wearing a leather jacket or a bomber type jacket and also a beanie hat. The attendant observed Sue and this young man having a conversation for a couple of minutes. Obviously she was unable to hear what was being said because they were outside and she was inside the gas station. But after their conversation ended, Sue walked into the gas station shop alone and she asked the attendant if it would be possible
possible for her to leave her car in the parking lot overnight because she was having some issues with it. She was having car trouble and she was unable to drive it home. And the attendant said, yes, that was no problem as long as she moved it to the other side of the parking lot because I think they were going to be like shoveling up the snow from the area where Sue had parked originally. Sue said thank you. She walked out of the shop, moved her car to the other side and then the gas station attendant watched as Sue got into the car that the young man drove, this light coloured car. She got in the passenger seat, the man got in the driver's seat and he drove away. One source states that he headed west on Highway 5 and that was the last time Time that Susan Swaddell was ever seen. To this day, more than 35 years later, that is the last ever confirmed sighting of her. After getting into the car with this man, she disappeared. She completely vanished. Of course, Susan never returned home that night, and it wasn't long before her mum, Kathy, and her little sister, Christine, who by this point was around 16 years old, it wasn't long before they really started to worry, because as I said, Sue's work was only about five to six miles away from her home in Lake Almo. It would have taken her maybe 10 to 15 minutes to drive home normally, so as time was going by and she still hadn't walked through the door, their anxiety level were just increasing and increasing I'm sure and they were especially scared because of the weather conditions it was awful weather to be out driving in the blizzard obviously meant that it was pretty dangerous to drive on the road so they were terrified that maybe Sue had gotten involved in some kind of car accident maybe her car had skidded and collided with another vehicle maybe she had skidded off the road into a ditch or something I can only imagine that so many different terrible scenarios were just going round and round in their heads. But to try and find out what had happened, where Sue might be, her mother Kathy started just ringing around different people. I think she rang the Kmart store where Sue worked just to see if maybe she was still there, but I don't believe anyone picked up the phone because they would have been closed by this point. She rang highway patrols nearby trying to find out whether there had been any car accidents that evening, but she had no luck with that. And so at around 11 p.m. that night, Kathy picked up the phone again but this time to call the police. She called the police and told them that her 19 year old daughter was missing. So after receiving this report, an officer was, I believe, sent to have a look along the route that is believed Sue would have driven home. And it didn't take this officer long to find Susan's vehicle, the maroon 1975 Oldsmobile Cutlass. Obviously he found it at the gas station, parked in the gas station. And what was odd was that Sue had left pretty much all of her belongings in the car. Her driving license was still in there, her glasses, her purse, her wallet with her money in it. She just left all of that in there. She didn't take it with her wherever she went. It seems the only thing that she did take with her were the car keys. The car was locked when it was found and the keys were gone. Now by the time the car was found, I think it was like the middle of the night, just a few hours after Sue was reported as missing. So the gas station was closed. There was no one in there that the officer could speak to and so instead he decided to basically just go along the rest of the route to Sue's house thinking that perhaps she decided to walk the rest of the way. Maybe she started walking but she had an accident however the officer went along the route numerous times I believe and they never found anything absolutely no sign of Susan. The following morning deputy officers went back to the gas station again and as it was now open they went inside to speak to the staff and luckily the attendant who was working that morning was the same attendant who had been working at the gas station the night before so the night that Susan was there and she told the police everything that she could remember she told them that Susan had said that she was having trouble with her car and she asked if she could leave it at the station overnight she said that she saw Susan having a conversation with a young tall man and that she left the gas station with this man she got into his car and they drove away now now, as soon as the police heard this account from the gas station attendant, it seems as though they immediately jumped to the conclusion 
that Susan was a runaway. They believed that because she appeared to have gotten into this man's car willingly, then that meant she was probably fine. They assumed that that man was a boyfriend or a friend or an acquaintance and that she had chosen to take off with him and leave town. And they said that because she was 19, she was no longer a child, she was free to do what she wanted, so they weren't going to carry on the search for her. That was that. The investigation into Sue's disappearance basically ended there. I mean, they spoke to and took statements from a couple of people. They took statements from Sue's managers at her jobs. They obviously took that statement from the employee of the gas station. And at some point, they had the employee assist them in creating the composite sketch of the man that Sue left with that night. But apart from that, they didn't really do much more. As I said, as soon as they found out that Sue left with that man voluntarily, they just decided that that was the end of it. She must have been a runaway, case closed. But of course, Susan's family, her mother and her sister, did not believe that that was the case at all. They did not believe for a minute that Susan had decided to run away because that just was not her. She was a responsible young woman and she was close to her family. There was no way that she would decide to just leave home, leave town without telling them. And they told the police that. They said that it was not in her nature to do something like this. But still, I believe the police were pretty fixated on their theory that she was a runaway and they continued to have that belief for a while. And so, yeah, they didn't do very much to help look for her because they didn't believe that she was in any danger. Because of this, they didn't conduct any kind of search, forensic search of Susan's vehicle. They didn't check it for fingerprints. And so not long after it was found at the gas station, it was just allowed to be taken back to the Swiddell's home. However, about five days after Susan went missing, her mother Kathy decided to take the car out for a drive. She decided to drive it to a grocery store, according to one source. And interestingly, she noticed that not long after she started driving it, the engine began to overheat, which if you remember, that was the same issue that Susan had on the night that she disappeared. Clearly there was something wrong with the vehicle, and so Kathy took it to a repair shop so that they could try and find out what needed fixing. And the mechanic who took a look at Susan's vehicle actually discovered that the reason the car had been overheating so quickly was because the pet cock, which is like a small plug or a small bolt located on a car's radiator, that had been loosened in Susan's car. And this would mean that if the car was driven for more than a couple of miles, the water would drain out of the radiator and the car would begin to overheat. And clearly that is what happened to Susan on the night that she vanished. As she was driving home, the car overheated because of the loose pet car. And so she pulled into the garage because she was nervous about driving it. And when her mother, Kathy, was told this by the mechanic, she immediately informed the police. And from what I can gather, it was then when the police started to take this case a little bit more seriously. It was then when they started to think, hang on a minute, maybe something sinister did happen to Sue that night because they started to theorise that perhaps someone had tampered with Susan's car. Maybe while she was at work that day, someone went to her car in the parking lot and they purposefully loosened the pet cock plug on the radiator so that the water would drain out and the car would overheat because then she would be forced to pull over on her way home later that night. Maybe when she left the shopping mall after her shift, this person followed behind her in their car and they pulled in after her at the gas station. They got chatting to her, they learned that she was having car trouble and so they offered her a lift home in their car and Susan accepted. She probably would have just been so grateful that it perhaps didn't cross her mind that this could be potentially a dangerous situation. It didn't cross her mind that maybe this individual didn't have the best intentions. I mean, we don't know who that man was that she left with that night. He has never been identified, so we don't know if she knew him personally or if he was a stranger. But Susan's loved ones, her family, have said that she could be 
quite naive at times. She was very, very trusting of people. So they do believe that if someone was offering her a lift, she would have gotten in their car willingly. And she wouldn't have considered at the time that maybe they did not have good intentions because she was so quick to trust people. That was just her character. So yeah, when the police found this out about the loose plug in her car, that was when they started to investigate this case a little bit more. They believed that Susan's car had possibly been tampered with and that she may have actually been the victim of foul play rather than a runaway. So they started looking into different lines of inquiry. They started taking statements from various people in Susan's life, including her co-workers at both of her jobs. And that was when they found out about Susan's outfit change. If you remember, before Sue left the Kmart store that night, she got changed out of her red pantsuit and into a sweater and a skirt, which her colleagues thought was a little odd due to the fact that it was snowing and it was cold outside. Now as I understand it from what Sue's sister Christine said on the Unfound podcast, the outfit that Sue changed into was the outfit that she had worn earlier that day during her shift at the boutique shop. So she had one outfit for the boutique shop and one for Kmart and after her shift at Kmart she decided to change back into the outfit that she wore during her shift at the boutique shop which was the sweater and the skirt. Perhaps she did this just because it was a comfier outfit to wear during her drive home or something. Or it has been theorised that maybe she changed because she planned to meet someone after work that night. Maybe she had arranged to go on a date or something and for this date she would have preferred to have worn the skirt rather than the red pantsuit. The only problem that I have with this theory is that if she was going to meet someone after her shift, why hadn't she let her mum and her sister know that that was her intention? Why did she call home just a few hours before her shift ended and tell them that she was going to come straight home after her shift if she knew that she wasn't? But that wasn't the only odd thing that happened in relation to Sue's clothing from that day. You see, about a week after Sue vanished, her 16-year-old sister Christine arrived home one afternoon. She had been to school that day and when she got home, she went to grab the spare front door key to let herself in. But the spare key wasn't on this shelf where it was usually kept. It was gone, but it didn't take too long for Christine to find it. She soon discovered that it was on another shelf underneath a box, which was weird because that wasn't where it was put normally. But anyway, she grabbed the key, opened the front door, and one of the first things that Christine noticed was that there was a very, very strong, sweet, smoky smell in the air. Some sources state that it was it smelled a bit like marijuana. So that was odd because no one in the house smoked marijuana. But anyway, Christine continued looking around and another thing that she noticed was that there were a load of dirty dishes in the kitchen sink, which had not been left there by Christine or Kathy. Someone else had left these dirty dishes in the sink. Someone else had been inside their home. Of course, Christine started to get a little bit scared at this point because of the dishes and the smell in the house and so she rang her mum Kathy. Kathy came straight home and the two of them immediately began looking around the rest of the house to see if there was anything else that looked a bit out of place and they were very keen to see if they could find anything in Sue's room because they thought that maybe Sue had returned home after a week. Maybe the smell of marijuana and the dirty dishes in the sink had come from her. Maybe she had used the spare key out to get in and she just put it back in the wrong place when she left. So they went up to Sue's room and on an initial glance everything in there looked normal. It was neat and tidy as she had always kept it. Sue was always a very clean and tidy person. Nothing appeared to be out of place or at least that was until they took a look underneath Susan's bed. You see stuffed underneath her bed Kathy and Christine found the red pantsuit that Sue had been wearing on the day that she disappeared, the suit that she changed out of before she left the Kmart store. Now, as far as I'm aware, this red pantsuit 
was missing along with Sue. It wasn't found in her car or at the gas station or left at the Kmart. As I understand it, it was gone when Sue went missing. It appeared as though she had taken it with her when she left with that man. She didn't take her glasses or her driving license or purse, but she took this pantsuit. And then a week later, the pantsuit turns up underneath her bed in her house and I think this is one of the most confusing parts of this whole case. Who the hell put this pantsuit there and why? Was it Sue? Was she alive? Did she return to her home and leave that mess in the kitchen sink and cram her pantsuit underneath her bed? Or did someone else do it? Whilst Kathy and Christine were out of the house that day, did someone who was involved in Sue's disappearance go to the house, use the spare key to let themselves in? Obviously that indicates that they must have known where the spare key was hidden. They used the key to let themselves in and whilst they were there smoked marijuana and left the dirty dishes in the sink and then just put Sue's pantsuit underneath her bed. I just really struggle to understand why someone would do that and Susan's sister Christine has said the same. She says that she just does not understand that at all. It's just so bizarre. I mean what reason would Sue or another person have had for going into the house and essentially hiding that red pantsuit? Maybe if it wasn't Sue that did it, maybe if it was someone involved in her disappearance, possibly in her mother, Murder. Did they do that to try and make it look as though Sue was still alive? They wanted it to appear as though Sue herself had gone back to the house and put the pantsuit in her room and then leave again? I don't know. It's so, so confusing. And I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on that in the comments. According to a few sources, the pantsuit was never tested for fingerprints by the police at the time. Obviously, at this time in 1988, forensic technology was in its infancy and therefore not not very advanced and useful so they probably wouldn't have been able to like detect any blood or other bodily fluids on this pantsuit but I don't know why they didn't test it for fingerprints honestly it does just seem like the police did a pretty terrible job at least in the very beginning of this case from what I can tell they they could have done a lot more to help in the search for Sue and I'm really not sure why they didn't do more probably because a lot of them were still clinging on to the theory that Sue was a runaway who knows but of course two people who were doing absolutely everything that they could to try and find Sue were Kathy and Christine. They had posters and flyers with Sue's face on printed out and they distributed them around the area and surrounding areas. They were just trying so hard to spread awareness of Susan's disappearance obviously in the hopes that someone would recognise her, recognise her face and come forward with information. Of course the ex-boyfriend was looked into if you recall from earlier Susan used to date this guy who was a few years younger than her. They were together for about a year and a half and then they split up. So he was looked into as a possible suspect but I think he was ultimately ruled out. There was nothing to link him to Susan's disappearance. Although something else that the police discovered was that in the weeks leading up to her disappearance Susan had been using chat lines to speak to a couple of different men. In fact according to one source she had been using the chat lines so much that in like one month, I think in the month before she vanished, her telephone bill had reached around $300. And her co-workers told the police that, again, in the lead up to her disappearance, she'd been receiving numerous calls at her work from this one man in particular, and his name was Dale. And her sister, Christine, actually said that just the day before Susan went missing, she mentioned this Dale to her mum, Kathy, and how she wanted Kathy to meet him at some point. So it does seem as though she was very close with this man and she really liked him. Maybe they had started seeing each other. It's not clear if Susan ever met him in person or if she had just been speaking to him via the chat lines and via the telephone. And as far as I'm aware, the police have never identified him. They've never found this Dale. They've never been able to trace him. No Dale has ever come forward. So for that reason, a lot of people think that maybe he could have had something to do with Susan's disappearance. Maybe Sue had arranged to meet him after work that day. Perhaps they had arranged to go on a date, but he in fact had more sinister intentions. Maybe he 
maybe he abducted and killed her. And I think the police did try to track down the other men that Susan had spoken to via the chat lines, some of which they weren't able to identify, some they were. But again, there was no concrete evidence to prove that the ones they did trace were involved in what happened to Sue. But this Gale guy is definitely one person of interest in this case. Another person of interest was a man who is just known in this case as the Bumpers guy. And that's because just a few few weeks before Sue went missing, around the beginning of January in 1988, Sue and her younger sister Christine went to an under-21s club called Bumpers. They went there on a few occasions, I believe, and while she was there, Sue caught the attention of this one guy, the man who is now known as the Bumpers guy. His real name has never been released to the public, but apparently his father was the owner of this under-21s club, and Bumpers guy was was quite popular. He had a lot of friends. I think he was a bit of a ladies man and yeah he took an interest in Sue when he saw her at the club and she seemed to take an interest in him too. They would chat and dance together and he would ring Sue at home and they would chat on the phone. Her sister Christine said that they may have met in person outside of the club a few times. He came over to Sue's house maybe once or twice. So he was considered a person of interest when Sue disappeared. Again like Dale it it was theorised that perhaps Sue had arranged to meet this man from the Bumpers Club that night and that he did something to her. Now Susan's sister has said that she believes that the composite sketch of the man that Sue left the gas station with that night does resemble the Bumpers guy. Obviously she met him at the club too and she believed that the sketch looked like him and apparently at the time of Sue's disappearance the Bumpers guy drove a car that somewhat matched the description of the car that the unidentified man was driving that night. The car that Sue got into at the gas station. However Bumpers guy was looked into by the police and he was questioned but it turns out that he did have an alibi for the night in question and so in the police's eyes he's not really considered a suspect although Christine herself does have doubts about this. During the Unfound podcast episode she does say that something in her gut tells her that he may have been involved because in her opinion he does look like the composite sketch but again just to reiterate the police have said that he does have an alibi for that night. Eventually days without Sue turned into weeks, weeks turned into months and months turned into years and there was nothing, no sign of Sue, no trace of her anywhere and no answers for Kathy and Christine. The year after Sue's disappearance in 1989, May of 1989, a potential lead in the case did emerge when the dead body of a young woman was found and the police thought that it could have been Susan Swiddell. So they got a hold of her dental record so that her teeth could be compared to that of the victim but it turns out that it was no match. This woman was not Susan. A couple of other tips and leads came in over the years, but nothing really led the police anywhere. They all just kind of resulted in dead ends. In 2006, so about 18 years after Susan vanished, the police detected that there had been some recent activity on Susan's social security number, which initially gave them a bit of hope. They thought that maybe Sue was alive and that she was trying to use her social security number to apply for a job somewhere or something. However, when they looked further into this, they discovered that it was actually a case of identity theft. They found that this woman in California had been trying to use Sue's social security number to apply for a role in the army. So again, that was a lead that resulted in a dead end. In 2018, so 30 years after her disappearance, the 30th anniversary, Susan's case was if effectively reopened. A cold case unit was put together to reinvestigate the case. They were going to go over all of the evidence, all the suspects, all the statements that had ever been taken in the hopes that they might be able to produce some fresh leads or discover something that previous detectives had missed. But as far as I know, nothing majorly significant has come of that as yet. A couple of age progression photos have been created and released to the public to show what Susan may look like now and in more 
more recent years. If she is still alive, those photos will be on the screen. And in addition to that, a $25,000 reward is currently being offered to anyone with information regarding what happened to Sue and to anyone with information that leads to the arrest and the conviction of the person responsible for Sue's disappearance and possible murder. Tragically, I think it is believed by most that Susan probably is deceased that she probably met with foul play that night but it's just awful for the family that they they've never had those answers they've never had that closure even to this day more than 35 years later this remains a mystery the disappearance of Susan Swiddell is a mystery but it is not a closed case as I understand it there are still detectives working on it to this day Susan's loved ones have not given up the search for answers her sister Christine who is now currently in her 50s. She runs a Facebook page called Swiddell Strong where she still tries to spread awareness of her sister's case and I just hope to God that Christine and her mother Kathy will have the answer soon. Like I said it's awful that even three and a half decades later they are still looking for Susan trying to find out what happened to her that night. Christine actually said during the Unfound podcast that life is just lost without her. Life is lost without Susan. As I said at the beginning of this video, there will be some contact details in the description box in case anyone watching may have any information about Susan's case. I would also ask to all of you watching if you could please share Susan's missing posters to your social media platforms. It literally takes seconds to do and you never know what could come of it. It could help. The more this case is talked about, the more people see Susan's face, the higher chance we have of the right person learning about this case and going forward to the police with information that could solve it. So please, please take a screenshot of the missing poster and share it. And yeah, that is it for this case. That is the unsolved case of Susan Swiddell. I look forward to hearing your thoughts and opinions on this case in the comments, what you think might have happened to Susan. Do you think that one of the men that we've talked about was involved, that guy from the Bumpers Club or that Dale guy that Susan was speaking to via the chat lines? Like I mentioned earlier, the police have, I guess, basically ruled out the bumpers guy but Sue's sister Christine still is not completely convinced that he was not involved that's her opinion and as I said the Dale guy has never been traced to this day the police have never been able to identify him which to me speaks volumes because surely if you were this Dale and you had nothing to do with Sue's disappearance you had a clean conscience surely you would come forward to the police just to make sure that you were ruled out just to help the investigation investigation. That to me just seems very, very suspicious that this Dale has never come forward, but maybe he wasn't involved at all. Maybe the man seen at the gas station with Susan was a random stranger. Maybe he noticed that she was having car trouble and he saw this as an opportunity. He offered Susan a lift home, she accepted, but when she got in his car and he started driving, he didn't drive her home as promised. Instead, he did something to her, something evil. Of course, this is all still speculation because we don't know the truth. Susan's family are still waiting for the truth to be discovered. So again, please share the missing posters. Please share this video, particularly with anyone you know who lives in the area where this happened, lives in Minnesota, or someone who did live in Minnesota at the time that this case occurred or has or had relatives or friends that live there. And of course, if you have any information about the disappearance of Susan Swedell, please get in touch with the authorities and use the contact details in the description box. But yeah, that is it for this case. Again, let me know your thoughts in the comments. I would really love to hear what you guys think. Also, feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. Give the video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and you like this kind of content. And I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Yeah.